The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Our topic today is commissioning energy storage projects. And to begin with, I'd like to go over a quick housekeeping slide. Today, all of our participants will be in listen-only mode throughout the broadcast, so we will not be able to hear you. You can connect to the audio portion of the webinar using your computer's speakers or a headset, or you can listen in via telephone. If you do listen in via telephone, you might get charges, so we suggest using your uh, computer speakers or headset. Um, we're also encouraging all of our webinar participants today to please type questions into the question box that you'll see on your console. You can type your questions in at any time during the broadcast, and we will save time for a Q&A session with the audience at the end of the webinar. Um, this webinar is being recorded, and it will be made available to you on the Clean Energy States Alliance website at cisa.org slash webinars, as you see on your screen. And with that, I would like to introduce Todd Olinsky-Paul. Todd is the project director for STAP at, at CISA, and he is going to introduce today's speakers and talk about our webinar today. Todd, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Samantha. Uh, so I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, this is uh, a webinar on energy storage project commissioning. Uh, which I think is going to be a very interesting topic. Uh, you can go ahead and advance the slide, please. Uh, I want to first uh, give a big thank you to Dr. Emery Zhuk of the U.S. Department of Energy and Dan Borneo of Sandia National Laboratories uh, for supporting this project. Next slide, please. And um, I just want to very briefly orient everybody as to <coughs> what STAP and CISA are. Uh, CISA is, is um, the Clean Energy States Alliance. We're a nonprofit, and we primarily work with states to help them implement their clean energy policies and programs. STAP is one of our uh, projects, and it's conducted under contract with Sandia National Laboratories and funded uh, by US DOE. And uh, key activities are to disseminate information, which is what we're doing right now with this webinar, and to facilitate uh, state public-private partnerships to get energy storage projects uh, developed. And you can see there's a map there that shows some of the areas around the country where we're working on various projects in collaboration with Sandia and DOE. Next slide, please. Uh, I just want to uh, mention, I always get questions on this. Yes, the webinar will be recorded and archived. Uh, this is a screenshot of the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, at, or STAP, webpage. Uh, encircled in red is a button that you can use to sign up for our uh, email notification service to be notified of future webinars and other events and information. And on the left, there's a red arrow pointing out the link to our webinar archives, where this webinar and all the others that we've done over the past years uh, are saved, and you can view them at any time. Next slide, please. OK, so uh, I would like to go ahead and introduce our speakers for today. Uh, we have Imri Zhuk, Program Manager of the Energy Storage Program at US DOE, which is in the Office of Electricity Deliver Delivery and Energy Reliability. And then we have a, a joint presentation from Dan Borneo and Matt Galland. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Matt. Uh, Dan Borneo is the project leader for <coughs> the Electricity Electrical Energy Storage Systems Demonstration Program at Sandia National Laboratories. And Matt is the uh, principal for Renewable Energy Project Solutions at SunPower. And then uh, following their presentation, we will have Lori Florence, who is a principal engineer for large format batteries at UL. And so this is, uh, we have a lot of material, and we're going to try to leave space for questions and discussion after these presentations. So if you have a question or a comment, please type it into the 
message box that you'll see on your screen. Do it as, as it occurs to you. Don't wait till the end. And I will do my best to get to as many of those questions uh, and discussion items as we can following the presentation. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Imri Zhuk of DOE. Emery? Emery, I think you need to unmute your uh, your phone. There, I'm unmuted. Uh, it's a pleasure to be opening this uh, FDAP uh, webinar. Uh, on an extremely important topic. It is energy storage commissioning. Commissioning is essential. We are seeing an increasing number of installations around the country, and we will be seeing more installations of energy storage, uh, particularly with goals like uh, California's uh, 1.3 uh, gigawatt uh, of storage. We're also seeing an increasing number of technologies. And uh, we want to make sure that these projects, as far as we can help it, uh, go without uh, trouble. Uh, this is necessary to build confidence in customers. Every uh, startup of a project uh, of the actual functioning of a project that doesn't work uh, is going to decrease confidence in the customer in the, in the technology. Uh, failed or faulty systems will hurt the entire industry, uh, let alone the, the company that fielded the system. Commissioning and witness testing uh, is necessary in the factory and in the field, uh, particularly in larger units uh, one has to be out there and make sure it works on location. And uh, if you do this correctly, uh, the commissioning experience uh, will cut costs. Uh, you know, commissioning should go uh, without any glitches, without any problems, uh, in with maximum efficiency. Now we realized. Uh, we sent out uh, quite a number of uh, teams uh, to commission individual systems that were uh, completed uh, in the context of the uh, ARA stimulus program uh, and also uh, other programs. And we realized there is need for a standardized approach, uh, a manual, uh, how to do commissioning uh, in a uh, standard and correct way. And uh, so I asked uh, Sandia National Laboratory and PNL uh, to uh, essentially work at producing such a standardized manual on commissioning and witness testing. And this is the result. And uh, uh, I'm finished now. And uh, the presentations will start. OK, thank you very much, Henry. So uh, without further ado, we will uh, introduce again Dan Borneo and Matt Gilland. And I believe uh, Dan is going to start, and the two of them are going to tag team for this presentation. So uh, Dan, please proceed. So uh, good morning, Dan Borneo. Uh, thank you for attending. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the commissioning um, um, plan and overview. Got ahead of myself there. And I'd like to acknowledge um, Dr. Emery Zhuk and the DOE for sponsoring our program. And I, I was told that I, for once I thought I had more time than slides, but I was told that that's not the case. So once again, I'll be moving uh, quite quickly. Um, so here's my outline, little introduction to commissioning, the overview of the project and commissioning process, uh, some of the commissioning activities 
during the design and construction phases, and then um, the commissioning phase itself. And then Matt's going to be doing a case study. And um, I'm just going to do a recap uh, before I turn it over to Matt on the case study. So uh, just to note, this presentation will cover the commissioning process only, uh, and not the actual test. Um, as Emory stated, we're developing a manual, and this this um, this presentation here kind of looks at the process that the manual will have. In addition, the manual will also have a little bit more detail in the actual test. Um, since the actual tests and checklists are project specific. If you need more information or assistance, please let me know. You know, I'm trying to click. Try again. Just double click on your screen. There you go. OK. So just an introduction to commissioning. So it is one step in the project implementation plan. And this is the step that verifies that the installation was done correctly into code. And the test that the devices, the facility, the system, whatever it is, performs as it was designed and, and meets the objectives and the criteria. Another thing about commissioning, um, it's overlooked a lot of time, is that commissioning is an excellent means to help familiarize the o &M staff with how the system works and uh, how it operates and how to respond in an emergency. So here's the overview of the pro project implementation process. You, know, you have your project development, you have your design, construction, commissioning, and then the closeout, right? And this gives you, ensures that a safe and reliable system is specified, designed, and installed. Um, and we're going to focus mostly on commissioning, but there are some points in commissioning that starts at design and through construction. And here's the commissioning process. You have your operational acceptance testing. And I will get into the details of all these in later slides. Um, some tagging process, the startup, the functional acceptance test, and then the shakedown. And a little bit about the tagging process, one thing is, uh, there's always seems to be question of who owns the system at what stage of the game. Um, by doing a tagging process, this allows, um, helps, I should say, the, the ownership question. Um, with the yellow tag between the OAT and startup, that's usually when it's owner operated, but still construction owned. And then once a functional test, is, functional acceptance testing is done, then that tag is when you actually hand it off and it's owned and operated by the by the owner. And with commissioning, as Emery alluded to, that ensures a safe and reliable system is installed as designed and is verified operational. And so those that are uh, out there daydreaming, a little food for thought, uh, that's my boat. I mean, one, one day I'm going to go to Tahiti and and lay claim to it. So moving right along now, the commissioning activities during design. Um, one thing is, is you don't want to start commissioning when the construction complete uh, flag is raised. You want to start commissioning activities at the very beginning. Uh, you identify your team, roles and responsibilities. You integrate that team with the overall project team. Some cases, it might be one and the same. Some, some situations, it might be two separate teams. But what you don't want to have is one team over the project team building it over on one end of the, the building and the commissioning team over on the other end of the building. Um, it, it, it'll cause you heartache. So at this point, you want to um, identify your players. Here's a list of, of stakeholders. This is not all inclusive. Uh, and, you may or may not have all these people on your team. This is when you want to get the specifications, all the applicable codes and standards. Uh, Lori will be talking more about codes and standards uh, later on this morning. 
um, you know, you you want to understand what the system is you're buying, um, the kilowatt kWh rating, the parameters that the system needs to meet. This is where you want to start developing your sequence of operations. What applications will the system serve, and how will you control it? Develop your equipment list of the of the, the equipment that will be commissioned. All your um, safety requirements now. What safety systems need to be installed to ensure safe operation, and what safety systems do you need to, to um, have in place to ensure a safe construction? And commissioning, and this is uh, where you want to do that work. So then, as you move on into construction, you have your factory acceptance testing. This is where you go out to the vendor to conduct testing at the at their uh, factory. And what you want to do here is you want to try to do as many tests as you possibly can at their factory. It's much easier to correct problems there than in the field and some of these systems are fairly new and it's very important that you do it here and that testing will be based upon your sequence of operation and, and any safety features that you can test in the factory and now you want to start developing your startup procedures once again you don't want to wait to the last minute you start it up now based on the equipment list the system manuals the sequence of operation um, and then the operating specifications. And since that's kind of a weird term, I defined it there. And, and, and my definition is the parameters that the system, system should operate within. That would be your ambient, uh, any, any pressures, any flows, any, any, anything that, um, where the system needs to operate within. And um, now you want to start doing your uh, testing procedures. And basically, they should be very close to what you did in the factory, except now you're going to add your balance of plant to it and, and add those tests into your testing procedures. And your, your review checklist, you should, you should have. So when you go out to do your design verification, your designer should be out there verifying that the, situ, that the installation was installed as designed and specified a lot of times, contractors will take a little uh, artistic license with, with how how things should be installed, and that may may very well invalidate the whole design that the that the engineer had in mind. Um, making sure the labeling and signage is in place. A lot of times, you get to the end and there's no signage anywhere, and that causes a delay, and it's also a safety um, concern. If you don't know where things are fed from and you don't know thing, what things are called, make sure all your clearances, uh, you should have your authority having jurisdiction come through, make sure everything is installed per code. And it, of course, nothing is ever per perfect, so you're going to have a punch list. That's your um, items that need to be addressed and, and uh, corrected. And you should always note those items and have a plan um, uh, to, to to note them, to rectify them, and by and a sign off. And then you want to start developing your training and emergency response procedures. What do you you got to train your O and M? What's going to happen if there's a problem? How how is it going to be responded to? Who's going to respond? And then once always, you should always have your lockout tagout process in place and in operation. Moving on, now we head right to the commissioning process. So this is now the con construction is complete. Contractor says, I'm done. Now you need to say, OK, does the individual components of the system operate? That's the first step. One by one, you know, test that the electrical and mechanical components are ready for startup. This is when you do your mega ring, your torquing, your rotation phasing, making sure all the covers, all the barriers are in place all the controls in place, the point-to-point -point checkout, test the operation. Um, was there a coordination study done? There should have been. Has it been implemented in the field? All the relays are coordinated and the breakers coordinated. Verify that all your safety systems are installed and operating. Um, that would be your temperature, your leak, your security. 
et cetera, et cetera. Um, your communication systems are operating. Is all your metering in place? Is Are you reading the data? Do you have remote, um, com remote control as needed? Do you have your emergency procedures in place? Um, and, and at this point, when all this is done, all your punch list items are addressed, now you can tag the system and sign off. It, it, construction is really done, and, and it, but construction still owns, but it's ready to be operated by the owner. So the next is the actual startup. Very short list here, but very important on the field, out in the field, because this is when you really, you know, turn the switch on. It's very scary. Those who are involved with startup know that the scariest day is when you start turning things on and making sure that nothing gets impacted externally to your to your your project. Um, so you you use startup procedures to initiate the system and operate all the components. This is when you want to start doing your baseline data recording, the voltages, the currents, the temperatures, etc. If you can, um, perform your initial infrared scanning so you get a temperature uh, signature of the system and all the components. And then once again, you've got your punch list items, things that didn't operate as you wanted them to. And once all that is done, now you say the, quest, the next question is, does the system perform its intended service? Right, Using your testing plans and procedures, your sequence of operation, you want to test to see if it performs the application for which it was designed. This is when you test the entire system together, all the balance of plant, all the controls working, does it, is it uh, is the air conditioning keeping the battery is, or whatever system as cool as it's supposed to be? Um, is the, do you have the right exhaust system, the venting, um, everything? This is, this is it. This is to make sure everything works together. Um, training should be complete at this point for the operators, maintenance, because they're, they're the ones running it. Um, it's a warranty in place maintenance plan in place, and this is the one I always like there at the bottom, the 1-800 number. Who do I call in the event of emergency? And when all this is said and done and everything is, is good, now you can sign off owned and operated by the customer. And then once the customer owns it, this is a process, this is step I call shakedown. And so what happens when something bad happens? So if you lose any of your site utilities, does the system shut off in a safe and orderly manner? And when the utilities come back on, do this, does the system come back on in a safe and orderly manner? And this is um, a very important step. Not many people do it, but you should really consider uh, doing this step because Everything kind of works when everything's normal, but it's the abnormal, abnormal conditions that can really send you down, down the river. So with that, um, well, I'm going to turn it over to Matt. But before I do, I'm just to, just going to do a quick recap. So the commissioning process, it needs to be started early in the project, and it needs to be done whether it takes you five hours, five days, or five weeks, you need to do it. The commissioning team needs rep representation from all the stakeholders. You need to have all the people involved so you don't have any gotchas at the end when somebody shows up and they don't know what's going on. That includes your authority having jurisdiction and your first responders. And the last but not least, plan your work and work your plan. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt, who has a case study uh, where one might say we really didn't plan our work and work our plan so well. Matt? <laughs> Thanks for the uh, entree there, Dan. And for the record, everybody, my last name's Gallon. Thanks, everybody, for having me and inviting me to join today to share a little bit of a window into some of our experience 
on a program where we're trying to put some of those best practices that Dan outlined uh, for us uh, to work for us here. Um, it should be added that, uh, with all due respect, Dan, uh, I, I think a lot of what we're seeing play out, and, and just also for the record, Dan and I have been working on this project together for probably the last four plus years under this program that I'm going to provide a, a brief outline for you. I think if I double click, I'll have control. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so you know, I, I'm going to try to present a slightly higher level view of. It's not working on the down, or is it lag? Hold on. There it goes. So energy storage and energy, there we go, finally. Um, energy storage and energy storage plus PV in particular here is a uh, very hot topic and has been for some time. Uh, and we put a bid in SunPower on behalf of SunPower with the team that includes uh, DNV, which was formerly uh, Kima, Sandia by way of endorsements from the Department of Energy. Uh, ZBB and ICE Energy uh, all put in a proposal to the California Public Utilities Commission to site, design, install, and operate two separate systems. We were technology agnostic uh, at the outset uh, and most keenly, at least from the solar perspective, interested in the combined benefits of co photovoltaic systems plus energy storage uh, on the basis that the value proposition of the two should be greater than the two individuals uh, implemented separately. Um, this, it should be emphasized, is uh, a temporary uh, project. It is not a commercial. It's more of a commercial pre-commercial implementation for the purposes of demonstrating underlying technology where we can uh, go after, in, in particular, two different uh, value streams, uh, in particular, uh, peak shaving and load shifting uh, for uh, demand reduction, ultimately. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have any uh, tangible data to report yet, but this summer it's finally going to be showtime as the systems are nearing. Uh, final commissioning with Dan at the helm, as you see from his presentation, helping us navigate some of these uh, commissioning procedures. Uh, a word of caution, uh, when uh, I heard somebody say earlier, uh, when you go into uncharted territory, I think by very the very definition of us all sitting around the table, and I know I have a lot of technology uh, and uh, minded folks and engineers from different facets of the industry. Uh, we are venturing into new territory by definition, and therefore you need to be prepared to manage change over time. Uh, in our case, it resulted in the loss of a key demonstration partner. Target was our demonstration partner that was already hosting uh, existing PV systems that we were just going to bolt on, if you will, energy storage and then go about our business of studying the, the combined benefits. Uh, yet we lost them for a, a whole host of other reasons. Uh, one of our other, we actually had a third energy storage vendor who will remain unnamed uh, that originally was a part of the program that bailed out because of the change in our demonstration partners. And then along the way with the technologies and the particular siting requirements, we had to uh, be much more selective over our or I guess we should say the window of potential siting opportunities was narrowed depending upon the constraints of the particular technology that we're trying to implement. Um, siting requirements in particular were uh, the most onerous. In the case of ICE Energy, uh, those are HVAC systems or units, uh, thermal energy storage units that uh, operate in conjunction with HVAC systems, which in the case of their final uh, partner at Kohl's, demonstration partner at Kohl's, were constrained by roof loading limitations. Uh, shading also is an issue if they're mounted next to uh, solar. But let me step back again. My key message is from a program perspective, it's not 
just the technology, but it's some of the basics. And Dan even already started articulating it around. Do the planning up front. Start engaging the executives and the key stakeholders early. Make sure that the education uh, and training is in place. Get all people on the same pages, on the same page. And as I referenced in the second bullet point, keep everybody informed and engaged through regular meetings and updates. Uh, I know they seem onerous for some of the folks that might be around the table right now where I've led my team through the, through the, through the, the days of, of uh, many changes to the program uh, to some of the successes that we've made along the way. And let me just jump into some of that. Next slide. Oops. Can I go back? There we go. So after losing our customer, our demonstration partner uh, for ZVB at Target, uh, we started shopping universities and other commercial interests, and we found a, a, a very willing and, uh, and, and prepared uh, suitor at UCSD, thanks to the sponsorship of Byron Washam and Bill Torrey, who I believe is on the line today. Uh, and what made this site for ZVB especially appealing is because of the collaborative spirit that they brought to the table. They also had pre-qualified uh, sites that helped us short, uh, fast track, I should say, the design review and permitting process so we could get straight into the installation and commissioning work. Um, the, the point that I make under that is the sub bullet strictly commercial propositions impose logistical and operational limitations on pre-commercial demonstration project. This uh, was a new venture for ZBB at the time, uh, getting a UL, or in our case, ETL certification uh, for uh, the equipment that we're putting on. The distinction here is on the customer side of the meter as opposed to the utility side. You have to be, uh, as the permitting uh, and fire marshal authorities will attest, uh, you have to have appropriate uh, certification for all appropriate equipment. Uh, furthermore, in a commercial environment, uh, such as in the case of Target, I think what was ultimately the death knell for them is they have to have an operation that remains unaffected or at best is, is, is demonstrably benefited by the ins an installation of energy storage. And we could not guarantee that where we're going in with a demonstration of a temporary uh, installation that's trying to prove out new technologies. Um, so that led us to UCSD where now we're not just stuck with a commercial prop value proposition but rather also a collaborative learning and educational installation. Um, clarify siting capabilities and constraints early. This is uh, some of Dan's work in, in the steps preceding the uh, commissioning step. Ensure adequate coverage for design, engineering, permitting, procurement, installation, and, and systems integration work. Systems integration work is one of the critical steps that I've seen not just in this particular project under the CSI program, but other vendors and other uh, installations that I've had occasion to participate in or read about is while individual components may work, if they're not tied together, not communicating, if they're not, if the networks aren't available or the control systems aren't in place, then it's as good as just a black box sitting there with no value add and no intended purpose being served. Um, ensure essential permitting certifications education are explained and understood by the right stakeholders. ETL is not necessarily equal to UL if you're looking for a UL, or I should say if the permitting agency uh, is looking for a UL stamp. That, for the folks around the table, is easily overcome or was ultimately overcome by demonstrating that the same testing standards are applied, but it's rather just a different agency that's applying the certification. Uh, that wasn't self-evident to the permitting authority uh, having jurisdiction for our plans. We had to ask for an exception, and we got it. Same thing. CEO is not the uh, environment, health, and safety. Uh, we may have the endorsement in the ear and for that matter have the CEO at the table with us but not necessarily have the operational side of the house from uh, environment health and safety on board with us or educated on the systems and how it's going to ultimately work and likewise with the construction manager who's been there with the day-to-day -to, -day to see everything getting installed 
once it's handed off, when Dan, Dan has done all of his lockout, tagout, and handover, operations needs to be on site. They need to be brought on board early uh, and engage uh, EHNS through commissioning process, including testing, acceptance, verification, communications. So let me just keep on moving forward here. I'm going over my time. ICE at Coles, to their credit, ICE Energy had a uh, commercialized product that was already in the market and a well-defined design, build, and commissioning process already in place. Uh, there was, they, they basically pulled units off of the shelf uh, from the existing uh, installation, excuse me, uh, manufacturing, uh, and after some challenges in trying to find a, a, a suitable partner, we, we, uh, they partnered with Kohl's. We basically underwrote their installation in exchange for the data that we're now starting to finally see. However, important point, the last point there, ensure metering, data acquisition, reporting are in place. Uh, a given vendor or a particular customer or a certain utilities may be uh, used to gathering certain uh, bits of data uh, from the meter or from the customer or from their particular installation, if it's PV or energy storage, but now we're talking about an integrated environment where you need to capture at a minimum, in our case, net metering. Obviously, the energy saved in the case of ICE energy, it's offsetting the HVAC loads, or in the case of ZDB, it's energy produced or dispatched. You can't improve what you don't measure. Um, I could continue on <laughs> ad nauseum. This has been a uh, almost five-year program. Uh, there's lessons learned littered all down the path, uh, of, of which I've shared just a few highlights of in this presentation. I, I, I apologize for the brevity, uh, but I have lots more information. I'm glad to share it with the team around the table. There's my contact information, and again, uh, as we heard at the beginning of all this presentation, uh, and some additional slides that you did not see will be available after the fact. Dan or Todd, back to you. So I'll leave it with you. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you very much, Matt and Dan. Uh, we're going to move now to a presentation by Lori Florence, Principal Engineer for Large Format Batteries with UL. And while we're getting her presentation set up, I just want to uh, remind folks that uh, if you if you have questions or comments or discussion items, please enter them uh, by typing them into the question box that appears on your screen. Uh, we have 82 attendees of this at this webinar at the moment, and uh, I've gotten exactly one question. So chances are good that we can actually get to your question if you do send it in. So uh, please go ahead and do that if you if you have a thought or a question you'd like us to address you'd like to ask the, uh, the presenters to address. Okay, uh, Lori, please uh, take it away. Oh, I hope everyone can hear me, and, and thank you for allowing me to uh, participate in this webinar. I think a little bit about the NITS, uh, codes and standards. So moving on, and hopefully this will the delay. Just double click on the screen. And double click down. Let's see if that. All right, there we go. Okay. But anyhow, uh, so I'm just going to talk about some of the, the standards that are out there and how you would be choosing those terminology, uh, what dictates standards, effective regulation, presentation. Lori, we're having a bit of trouble with your audio. Um, are you using a computer speaker oh. as well? No, I'm using a headset. Okay, it sounds good now. Can you hear me? Um, we can hear you okay. now. Maybe I just wasn't speaking loud enough. Okay. okay. So just a, just some terminology. Of, if you're not familiar, a code, it's a document that is a, 
where this says a systematic collection of laws or regulations, which I think is something I got a definition, but essentially it's a, a document that can be used for regulation. Standard, of course, uh, that's established by consensus and approved by recognized bodies, the definition there. Uh, one thing to note about a standard is it has enforceable language and standards are what are used for uh, certification because of that. Recommended practice and guides. Recommended practice is similar to a standard. It does not contain mandatory language. And of course, a guide is, uh, provides useful uh, recommendations and advice. So just there's a, a number of uh, documents out there. And this is, I'm having very slow. So this is just kind of some examples of uh, standards and um, recommended practices and guides that are out there. Some of these are uh, safety related and, and some are performance and some are a combination. But just some examples and certainly not all inclusive but uh, primarily battery related. So what dictates the standards needed and certainly uh, the application, if it's a grid application, uh, for it's energy storage, for utility, or if it's commercial and residential, uh, something for data storage room, there's specific things that may be applied to that. So for applications, if some just some examples of standards that are application specific, as you can see on the left, uh, telecom standards, of course, are specific to that application. Uh, there's a number of standards that are, are just general, uh, for instance, stationary battery type standards. And as you can see, there's some performance uh, documents for PV and some specific to uh, grid utility connected systems. So then, of course, chemistry. Many of the documents are chemistry specific. And there's a, a mention of uh, different types of batteries, electrochemical capacitors. So again, um, you know, some of these same examples for these uh, standards, you know, many of them are lead acid, uh, nickel are traditional chemistry, so quite a few of them apply to that. There's some coming on board that are, um, include lithium ion requirements. Uh, a few that also include electrochemical capacitors and other types of chemistries. So some of them are written from the standpoint, for instance, the UL, uh, uh, there's IEEE 1679, are, they're written from the standard, or P, in the PNL document as well, are uh, non-technology, non-chemistry specific. But many of them are. So moving on to regulations, local and regional regulations will dictate also standards to be applied. So that's kind of the location, where you're putting it. So the effect of regulations on standard choices. So these are some examples of codes uh, that are written. NFP1, uh, a common one, NFP70, many people are familiar with the National Electric Code. Uh, ICC has a number of codes, the International Fire, Building Code, etc. And then, of course, if you, you have sort of plumbing or pressure vessel, ASME also has some codes. So adoption of codes and references to standards. So local municipalities and regional governments will use those codes, like the National Electric Code, as the basis for their regulations. And then these codes will require compliance to standards in a number of ways. So this is the, the connection to the standards. Some of the codes actually reference specifically standards uh, directly in the code. But many of them, such as the uh, National Electric Code, will have uh, informative, they'll have a list of standards is strictly informative, but what they will have is statements regarding that certain types of equipment must be listed. And their definition for listing actually infers by uh, definition of third party certification to an appropriate standard, uh, namely a safety standard. So that's kind of how uh, the standards uh, tie into these codes. So just to provide an example, and this is a very um, you know, simple example here, very basic. Um, like a small um, lithium ion energy storage system for use in a data storage center, and say it's installed in the city of Chicago. So there is, for instance, the electrical requirements in the Chicago Building Code. And as you notice there, is, it's dated. You can find this online, the building code. And it's based upon NFPA 70, the National Electric Code. And there's also, because this is a data center, it's referencing NFPA 75, which is uh, Protection of Information Technology Equipment. So they, you look in the, um, the Chicago Electrical Code, and it will have and that clause there, 182790.7, examination of equipment for safety. 
And there it states that all equipment, devices, and appliance covered by the provisions of this chapter shall be tested by and bear the label of a recognized testing laboratory. So that's a little bit of a difference from, say, strictly NFPA 70. NFPA 70 may call out certain types of equipment, but this seems to suggest that you know, if you're going to install something in the city of Chicago, it better have some kind of label on it. However, they do have an exception there. It says manufacturers distributors of specialized limited production or custom built equipment, which is no commercially available test laboratory. They may be applied for evaluation and recognition by the building commissioner, so it's a special permitting process. And then they say self-certification of equipment or installation shall not be acceptable. So you look again then on the clause 1827645.2, special requirements for information technology equipment. And it mentions it requires listed information technology equipment to be installed. So you know, if you're doing a computer room, it should supposedly meet uh, UL 6950 as an example. And then there's some other, uh, we just mentioned there's some other uh, applicable provisions, and that's just that because it uses the National Electric Code, it also has a Section 480 in the Chicago Electric Code, and, and other parts that may apply to, say, energy storage or battery systems would be in there. So it mentions that. So anyhow, it says that you know you have to have information technology equipment. So looking at an ANSI UL 6950 scope, uh, it says that it's the equipment covered by that scope is the standard is applicable to mains powered or battery powered information technology equipment including electrical business equipment and associated equipment with a rated voltage not exceeding 600 volts. And then it has some exclusions in the scope of that standard, including if it's strictly a battery system and it's not part of uh, ITE equipment, that's outside the scope. So then, um, as mentioned there, we have ANSI standard UL 1973 covers um, uh, stationary battery systems. So and that's out of the scope for that. So you can go to another, for instance, an ANSI standard, ANSI UL, or ANSI others, or other applicable standards, and some of these are referenced in the, say, the National Electric Code, and try to evaluate to that as an example. So I guess that's pretty much it for mine, and uh, I guess I can open that back up for questions then. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you to all our presenters. I think that um, I think that does conclude the the uh, presentations, and we could go ahead and begin to look at some questions that we we have received. Uh, so I'm going to throw these out. Any of you can can feel free to jump in on them. Uh, first one is: Is there any sample energy storage commissioning plan available now that energy that the energy storage community can use to develop a commissioning plan? So I guess that, in other words, is there a sample plan that they that could be used as a template? So uh, we are working on that, and I would ad ad advise that person who asked that question to get in contact with me, and we can discuss that. This is Dan Borneo. Okay, and and that's Dan Borneo at Sandia National Laboratories. Um, Samantha, we can um, do we have. Uh, contact information that we can put up on screen for for the panelists. Yep, I'll get that up in a moment. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, next question: How can we encourage utilities to collaborate more on standardizing commissioning activities and approvals? So I'll take a I'll take a crack at that. Uh, that's an interesting one because utilities. So I'm from I'm a behind the meter guy coming from industry. So I'm not that familiar with utilities, but utilities all seem to have their own commissioning programs. Um, as far as standardization goes amongst them, uh, that might be something that an EPRI could could advance uh, since they are a, a utility um, activity. I'm not quite sure I answered the question, but. Okay. Anybody else want to jump into that? Okay. Um, so oh, sorry, sorry. this is Matt Gallon. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Here, last minute. Sorry. Uh, one one of the important facets of our program, albeit it's been a little bit uh, dormant in 
while we've been trying to get our project projects off the ground. But it is to have an advisory review board with utilities participating and present uh, for periodic readouts on the status and sharing of some of these best practices, some of which we've identified here from Dan's presentation or otherwise. Um, we, in our case with the CSI program, are ultimately funded by California IOUs and PG&E has been instrumental in making some of that happen and we've had at least a couple of reviews with them. Um, that's feeding one particular utility, but then from there out to other utilities, I think it's by virtue of trade shows and presentations like this that hopefully we can get the message out to, to bring about more collaboration. Go ahead. Okay, thanks, Matt. I, one of the uh, listeners actually wrote in suggesting that EPRI uh, has something called the Energy Storage Integration Council, ESIC, that uh, does some work on coordinating uh, uh, commissioning, so or, or has something to do with commissioning. So that might be a good suggestion as well uh, for the utilities question. Okay, um, what type of battery chemistry is best for long-term unattended energy storage? I don't know if this is an answerable question. Anybody want to take a crack at that? So um, that that's too too vague. Um, if if the fellow one, this is Dan Borneo again. If the fellow wanted to uh, contact me. Uh, we could discuss, or I could lead him to somebody that might be able to help answer that question. But that's really not the intention of this webinar. Okay. Uh, here's a very specific question. Would a negative 48 volt system come under the ANSI codes, or would Telecoria guidelines cover these types of batteries? Well, uh, this is Lori Florence. We've actually evaluated uh, those for safety for battery rooms, but I think if it's going specific on a telecom site, they may have their criteria as well. Okay. Wow. So I guess it's, you know, the, the customer depends on the customer is <laughs> Right. So, uh, Lori, here's an interesting one. Yeah, go ahead. Lori, would it go ahead, be Dan. both? It could be if, if the customer is, uh, say, in, you know, a Verizon or, or whoever. It depends on who the customer is, but they may want to see. They have their own requirements, and they may want to also, um, you know, see uh, evaluation to, say, you know, the 6950 criteria, whatever that may be, if it's, you know, ITE-type equipment. Okay. Uh, this is a, a, a little uh, unusual question, but I think it's an interesting one. Are there any codes and standards applicable for compressed air energy storage systems? Well, I would um, say that certainly, you know, the piping codes, I know when we've looked at compressed systems, for instance, anything like piping and pressure systems, you know, might be able to be utilized on the ASME. Uh, as far as regulations, I'm not exactly sure about that, but there is some out there that address pressurized systems. It, just to add to what Lori said, um, so so a lot of these systems are are taking components that were utilized in other applications and now applying them to energy storage. So you, you there might not be a specific code for an energy storage application, but they could go back to the, you know, where where was it used, as Lori said, you know, in, in any type of piping project with pressure and utilize those codes and standards to help them get through an energy storage project. Okay, good. Um, are there important differences between utility-owned and operated versus IPPSR storage facilities? If yes, what are they? And this pertains to independently-owned storage facilities. This is Matt. If I could just chime in on behalf of the customer-sided installations, I can't speak on on behalf of the utility ones. I haven't worked on had the occasion to work on any of those. Um, uh, at least peripherally for those that I do know on the utility side, it seems that uh, 
on the commercial side, there much more attention to uh, the operational impacts, the resource requirements, space constraints, some of the fundamentals that you would otherwise dismiss when you're thinking about energy storage, but space constraints can be a real issue when you're talking about an existing commercial site. Um, space constraints, resources, uh, and ultimately a huge, huge one is safety. Uh, in, in the case of Target, you had customers uh, literally within you know feet of the storage device, which raised eyebrows when you couldn't pin your, you know, put your finger on the exact safety protocol or the uh, integrity of the system when we're still in a demonstration mode, uh, number one. Number two, uh, even if it's located off-site but a customer-owned uh, facility, uh, it has to be run through a very rigorous, and I don't suspect this is any or much different on the utility side, but a very rigorous uh, permitting uh, an approval process that includes reviews from fire marshal uh, and EHNS that maybe aren't uh, as rigorously uh, enforced necessarily, and, and I'd appreciate it if somebody else wants to chime in on behalf of the utility. But our sense is also because it's new, as I mentioned at the, in my presentation, these are new technologies, you're bringing people up to speed, it's a big black box, and they need to know what's going on with it. You have to spend a lot of time engaging those let's call them uh, a pertinent resources to making the energy storage system successful. A uh, lot more going into and impacted by uh, the particular installation in a commercial environment than behind the fence, in a field, uh, under the uh, exclusive control of a utility. That's my overall message. Yes, I agree with what Matt's saying. It, it's going to be different. Utilities have their own set of, of rules that they follow, and the rest of us have our set of rules that we must follow. So um, it it probably have to be, you know, some, something that's negotiated during the contracting stage and, and, and well understood. Okay. Um, can you estimate what percentage of total installation cost is typically dedicated to commissioning? And, uh, not and is it? <laughs> no, not enough. I was going to say the same thing. Yeah. It, it's usually overlooked. It, it, it's usually um, like a, a, a thing, but but I I couldn't really put a number to it. You, you know, it would depend on the technology. Depend. You know, it just. It just would depend on so many things, um, but but the inst but the commission the installation might take a week, and the commissioning might take a month, you know, or it might take a day, depending on on uh, how 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 uh, mature the the system is that you're installing. It, we should distinguish too that the costs typically are associated with hardware and ultimately you know, time, resources uh, dedicated to any given stage of the project. Uh, but I think uh, a lot of this commissioning work, as Dan outlined, is around process and communication and education, which, yeah, has a uh, hour uh, equivalent uh, of resources uh, required as an, ultimately a function of cost. Uh, but to Dan's point, not enough. I think it's also in terms of uh, attention paid to the overall subject of commissioning and education. Yeah, you, and usually the cost when you get into a big project, like if you're getting into a factory commissioning, uh, a lot of times the cost is buried in the individual um, uh, trade line item. So, so you wouldn't you, you wouldn't really have a a commissioning cost line item in, in your um, in your breakdown structure, it would just be buried in, in every component that was there. It was hard to break it out sometimes. But it, but there is cost because you're developing, you know, you're developing documents. Uh, you're you're going to have, you know, let's say for an energy storage system, just, just using some example to frame it. You have a one megawatt, one megawatt hour system. So, you know, you're going to have four or five documents various 
you know, the, the air conditioning systems and, and, uh, and the, any pump that you might need. And um, so it, it could take, yeah, it's just, it's just really hard to put a price tag on it. But, but as Matt said, it's, it's very labor intensive. So it's going to be labor. And if things go good, then it's going to be reasonable. And if things don't go so good, then it's going to get costly with the, with the man hour that you're going to spend on the system. But a lot of that will be uh, bore by the equipment owner, so it's really not your con contractor uh, cost so much. You know, if he installed everything correctly, it's going to be good to go. But it's going to be, if the system doesn't work, it's going to be your um, storage vendor who's going to incur most of that cost of making the system operate. Okay, so so here's a related question to, to that. Uh, the the questioner wants to know how you can include significant commissioning costs in a project proposal, for example, for a for an RFP. You're proposing a project, where how do you how do you include those costs in your proposal? You know, I will cut the chase, guys. I, I mean it, it's a swag number, but I mean, aside from putting it as a line item on a given project plan, uh, if, if to answer that specific question in the proposal phase, I would argue that it's somewhere in the order of magnitude of 10%. So just, you know, maybe stipulate if you're drafting the RFP or you're writing the response uh, that you clearly articulate what goes in that bucket and that you put a dollar against it uh, if it's a function of uh, of size of project maybe 10 percent uh, uh, extraordinary uh, but clearly you, you you should stipulate you know some fraction obviously uh, up to maybe 10 percent in terms of dollars and cents but maybe even be more specific in saying not just commissioning but what goes in that commissioning because obviously through Dan's presentation at least you have a bullet list of multiple items that you can uh, require or say that you're going to be providing, depending on what side of the RP you're on, uh, as a part of the, quote, commissioning phase. Uh, but it absolutely should be a part of the equation, more so uh, than just putting it as a line on, yeah, we're going to do commissioning uh, exercises as part of our hardware that you're buying, for instance. Okay. Uh, it, thank you. It's 2 o'clock. I'm wondering if we can stretch this for a few minutes. We have a lot of people still at, uh, on the line and a lot of questions yet to be answered. If you, you folks can stay on for a few extra minutes. Indeed. Okay. And I, just, I wanted to point out as well that we have contact information in the form of emails for all our presenters on the screen. If you uh, have a question that you want to be able to direct to a particular presenter by email, take a screenshot now because we're going to be replacing those, uh, replacing this slide with the URL for the, uh, for the website so folks can get uh, copies of the slide decks or review the presentations after those are archived. All right, a couple more questions. Um, we have two specific questions for particular service territories. One has to do with whether there are particular standards for battery storage in New York City and Con Ed's territory, and the other has to do with whether there are specific issues with regards to interconnection, documentation, protection equipment, et cetera, for connecting in uh, PG&E territory in California. So uh, I'm going to throw those together. Anybody have any particular knowledge of uh, standards or documentation requirements for either Con Ed or PG&E territory or of any uh, resources for finding this out? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll take that first stab at, at least on behalf of PG&E as uh, they are an advisory partner for our program. Um, uh, and, and partner uh, is the operative word there. Uh, Interconnection agreements, uh, I think, are fairly well understood by, well, most definitely from the solar industry. Utilities have standard procedures and forms for those. Energy storage is, they're, they're metting out uh, what those processes and protocols are and uh, 
uh, the allowable conditions, you know, one of the, the, the big bogeys that's out there is rate arbitrage and can you uh, allow energy storage, and I've, I've heard some musings of not allowing uh, exclusively energy storage to uh, export energy, uh, in other words, net meter energy storage, because the utilities don't want to give up that rate triage. Uh, but in my experience, and we did have one of, at one of the earlier incarnations of our program, the vendor dropped out, uh, did go through the interconnection paperwork, submitting of all the plans and the expected characteristics of the system. Um, and we were told that it was going to take a considerable amount of time, but because of existing partnerships, especially in the case of where they're literally helping fund our program, we got a fast track. We had the name of an individual, we had the phone number, we spoke with them on a regular basis, and actually got our paperwork almost all the way through, obviously short of final uh, 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 implementation and then ultimately permission to operate, but the interconnection agreement was vastly facilitated by having a strong relationship with the utility partner. I can't encourage that enough. Especially in this time of, of moving targets with standards uh, for what those interconnection agreements are. Great. Anybody want to jump in with any specific information on Con Ed's territory? And this is uh, Lori Florence. The only thing I know is that New York is looking at the Building Commission, uh, and this is more behind the meter, uh, customer siting, uh, looking at uh, developing criteria for installing uh, energy storage in buildings within New York City. So you may want to look at what they're, I think they're looking to current codes and standards to implement that. Okay, thank you. I can I can say that uh, if you go to the Con Ed website, they have a set of maps that shows uh, areas within their service ter territory where they are prepared to accept uh, synchronous generation and where they aren't. And I think uh, for something like energy storage, they would probably that would probably be relevant. It's it's um, it has to do with their their safety systems to protect their their line workers and equipment. So, uh, and those maps, I believe, they update fairly regularly, and and um, and they are they are progressively in, uh, upgrading their equipment in various areas of their their territory. So, you might want to check out their website for that. Um, okay, is there a commissioning package like this one tailored for microgrid designs? Any commissioning uh, materials for microgrids? So, so that would follow the same same program. Um, it, like I said, this was energy storage, but it could be applied across the board. Uh, this is a model that came from from industry, from the semiconductor industry, uh, where um, there were many. You know, the semiconductor industry has has microgrids throughout their factories. You know, uh, maybe they didn't have renewables per se, but they definitely had uninterruptible power supplies. Uh, they had generation. Uh, they had critical loads. The, the whole gamut. So, so anything that that you could throw at something in a microgrid, uh, you could apply this process to that project. Okay. Uh, there's a comment from a listener who says, uh, IEEE 1547 defines the minimum requirements for interconnection to the distribution system, and IEEE 1547.7 discusses the type of studies that may be required. Uh, connection at transmission level is discussed in several NERC documents. Energy storage is treated as any other generator. Uh, anybody want to address that? Is, is that right? Is energy storage treated as any other generator under the IEEE requirements and the NERC requirements? I don't think you can blithely say that it's treated as any other generator because if that was the case, then why can't you uh, export uh, as if it was a solar uh, energy uh, production uh, in, under net meter uh, 
environment. Um, so I think that's probably a good basis for uh, the beginning of an approach to an interconnection agreement, but that, I, I mean, my experience at least is not that it's just another generator. It's frankly anything but because of the number of services, ancillary services or otherwise that it can provide, uh, part of which is uh, energy production. Okay. Um, one, couple, one more question I think will probably be all we have time for. Um, so the, the question is, um, do you foresee the code requirements getting easier in the future as we gain more experience with storage equipment? Is that, this seems like kind of a softball, but the questioner goes on to say, uh, what is the battery size threshold that triggers the needs for checking and approval under electric codes, fire codes? I'm reminded that nobody required a check when I installed uh, my sub kilowatt UQPS battery. So what's the size threshold that triggers these things and is this going to get, uh, are there, or is it going to be easier as we, as we go along and get more experience and various uh, uh, agencies get more experience with batteries? So uh, probably Lori has a better answer, but uh, I'll jump in. So right now there really isn't uh, a lower limit to the battery size. I, I think common sense rules. Will codes get easier? Um, I, I don't think so. I think the code, uh, the NEC, for for example, will be a lot thicker. There's people working on uh, the new chapters for the, the um, for, for the battery section and, and maybe even a new chapter for energy storage. Um, I think if it's something that you plug into the wall um, as far as limits go uh, back to that question I, I don't I don't think that's going to be regulated um, but if it's something that's tying into the distribution system regardless I, I believe then that would be a good a good uh, stake in the sand that if you're tying it to the distribution system uh, like any electrical equipment then you're going to have to follow uh, any codes Standards, but if you're plugging it in, uh, no, and um, codes will get more stringent. We're finding a lot of gaps in the codes. We're finding uh, even with the PV codes, is there some gaps in in the grounding scenarios that, that the questions are being raised that uh, that's going to need to be addressed. So, um, and, and that same with the energy storage and the way you hook up your your uh, transformers and the way you ground them and, and such so the codes are going to get more uh, hopefully um, a little better and a little bit uh, easier so people understand what it is they need to do. This is Matt for what it's worth. Okay. Uh, I've seen uh, unfortunately, yeah, Matt. Uh, I was just going to say is I've seen systems uh, that have triggered the uh, code requirements by uh, the authorities having jurisdiction to go from anywhere from three kilowatts to 300 kilowatts. Um, so there's no size uh, threshold per se. I think Dan nailed it. Interconnection requiring an inverter on the distribution side. Okay. Uh, so unfortunately, we're, we're going to have to close this out. Uh, we do have other, other questions we haven't gotten to, but um, I, we, we've kept folks on for for well past our hour, so I want to uh, thank. Yes, go ahead. I just encourage the people with those questions. Uh, they have our email. If they know who they want to send it to, or they can send it to to all of us, and we'll try to answer them as best of our ability. Okay, very good. Uh, and uh, for folks who who would like to review this webinar again, go to the. Uh, to the CISO website, to the page for the STAP, uh, which is, as you can see, the URL on your screen. And uh, on the left side, there's a, uh, an archive button that will take you to the web webinar archives. Thanks again to all our presenters. Uh, very nice webinar. I think it was very helpful. And uh, with that, we will uh, conclude. <laughs>